Good evening. My name is Debbie Lawler, and I'm the regional manager for planning for Collier's Engineering and Design. Um, we are the consultant team working on the coastal resiliency plan for the foreshore um, community area. Uh, tonight, I'm going to go through a presentation with you to describe the project, um, the purpose of it, who's involved, um, the elements of it, our scope, and our timeline. Um, we're also inviting you at the end of this um, to go to the website and actually participate in providing information um, that we're seeking in terms of uh, identifying key assets uh, for the project. So I'm going to start to share my screen um, in just one moment. Let me just do a screen share here and then I will. Okay, let me go to the full page screen for you. Okay. Um, so the coastal resiliency plan, um, I'm hoping this, okay, it's out of my way. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna do. As I said, I'll talk about the purpose, the roles and responsibilities of the folks involved, our scope and schedule, address a bit of the public engagement that's taken place and will be taking place as we're moving forward, and then tell you a little bit about what we've learned so far and where we are looking for your assistance. So the Coastal Resiliency Plan itself, um, what it is is a way for the four municipalities um, of uh, Clinton, Westbrook, Old Saybrook, and the Borough of Fenwick to work together to achieve a comprehensive understanding of the future risks associated with sea level rise and to collaboratively develop a shared vision for a number of different strategies um, and projects that would reduce the risk of flooding in the future and build a community resilience um, for the region that we're looking at, the entire study area. The important part about working together, I always say when we're looking at something like uh, water, is that water doesn't know a municipal boundary. Okay, so when there's a flood, it doesn't stop at your, your town line, it just keeps going. And in this case, when we're looking at the shoreline in Connecticut in this region, it's great being able to work together because you can do projects that um, at an economy of scale benefits everybody involved um, and you are able to do it uh, a lot of times cheaper when you're working together. We're not starting from scratch. Um, there have been a number of recent plans that play into the background information that we're gathering. Um, there were resiliency plans in Old Saybrook and Clinton and hazard mitigation plans that covered Westbrook and Old Old Saybrook and Fenwick. Um, in terms of gaining local knowledge, what we're doing is we are working with municipal staff. And in this case, we actually have an executive committee for the project with members from every municipality involved. Um, we're talking to uh, local coastal resiliency committees and task forces that have already been established, the beach associations, and the residents and business owners um, at large, so the general public. A good definition of resilience is that it's the capacity of a social and ecological system to absorb or withstand disturbances and other stressors and still maintain its basic structure and function. What I like to say here is that it's always best when you could create a balance between the environment and the people that are in that area and the the land uses that are there so that they're working in harmony. When we're looking at it from the social perspective, we're looking at the human end of things. And the ecological one would be um, the natural system. So with resiliency, there are three interrelated strategies um, to address climate change that we look at. First, it's resilience itself, preparing for and improving the region's ability to recover and bounce back from a climate event. 
And the second would be adaptation. And that's where we're looking at changes that can be implemented to ensure that we can live with and adapt to the climate change that's taking place. A good example is you're seeing building elevations being changed, trying to remove them out of the floodwaters when they occur. Uh, mitigation is tackling uh, the causes of climate change by reducing things like greenhouse gases. So an example would be renewable energy. Um, we're looking at a number of different um, different ways under each of these um, that will come out of the project in terms of recommendations as we're moving along. So we say resilience of what and to, and to what. So it's really resilience of the communities to the climate stressors that are occurring. This includes sea level rise, coastal erosion, extreme precipitation and flooding, storm surges and the high winds that come along with these types of storms, extreme heat and warmer winters. So the benefits of resilience when we're when we're going through this and looking for strategies that would help the communities, um, we're looking at it from the perspective of protecting homes, businesses, your infrastructure in each of the municipalities, protecting the Long Island Sound and the natural environment that exists um, there, including your plant life, animal life, um, protecting the beaches and the wetlands. Um, in this case, you know, we're, we're concerned about things like erosion and protecting coastal attractions that are here because this is a tourist economy as well as, you know, a, a local um, established community year round. Um, proactively preparing for future disasters and disturbances so that you can respond more quickly and recover more quickly. Um, and building local capacity to adapt and learn from these past disturbances. So we're looking to sustain a high quality of life for all residents as we move forward by making changes and identifying what's taken place in the past to learn from that and move towards the future. So impacts occur across a number of different things. It could be the socio-political type scale, you know, from from looking at this from large scale, like the entire United States to the state region down to the landowners. And you're looking at different changes that would take place. So some of the things that take a lot longer is when you start looking at, you know, federal laws and regulations that could help um, towards assisting with resiliency matters. Um, it could go all the way down to land use and land management that we were talking about just a moment ago when I said, you know, raising building heights. Well, that that's where a zoning code would necessarily uh, have to be adjusted. Um, and land management by, might be even banking of of land um, for uh, to retain waters, you know, so that you have areas where they can flood and not disturb someone's property. And they also go across ecological scales. It could be things like our watersheds. Um, it could be the river um, itself and uh, the impacts, you know, that take place along the way. Um, we've seen things like big logs that have come down from, you know, washing out in other states like Vermont, like, new, you know, areas that are way north of here um, that ultimately land in the Connecticut um, riverbeds. So we look at the interconnectedness of the systems as we're going through this. When it floods, and you see a picture here, it doesn't just flood in the roadway and it doesn't just flood along the shore. It actually goes through lots of people's properties. It goes through different areas where, you know, people get stranded. Um, even in their own homes, if they don't evacuate fast enough, there's damage to lots of different uh, things. It could be businesses, it could be homes, it could be cars. So we look at the interconnectedness of all of this and look at how making an area more resilient actually uh, crosses the different lines. So we're going from residents to economics, meaning the businesses. It could be, you know, social and health related uh, matters, the natural environment, cultural can mean your historic um, facilities. It could be the arts um, where you have different facilities that could be impacted. 
Um, we're looking at, you know, your infrastructure, the roadways. So there's lots of different things that come into play here. For this study, um, there are different roles and responsibilities for different gr groups. And so when this was created, like I said before, there's an executive committee. There's two to three people from each town that are represented, and they help to guide the process. They laid out some uh, vision for what this would entail in terms of a project. We meet on a regular basis about every two to three weeks with status um, meetings. We also look at what the next steps are going to be. We talk about where the events are and what um, what information we gather from those events. Um, the next thing would be our stakeholders and the public. Um, stakeholders could be anything from like the beach associations. It could be the Chamber of Commerce. It, it um, could be a, you know, a business community uh, and the residents all play into the information that we're gathering. This is what the public outreach is about, community engagement events. This is why we need the input. Um, from this group in particular. This is where there's historic knowledge of what's taken place and it's information that we could get on a more granular basis um, about specific neighborhoods, which is very important to us. And then the consultant team is um, Anchor QEC and um, Collier's Engineering and Design. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit as we're moving along. Um, and again, here are the executive committee and, and what they're doing. So they are basically overseeing and guiding the planning process. And we'll be sharing our draft deliverables with them. We'll be talking about what we're finding and what we think would be good concepts to um, embellish as we're going along in the process and different strategies um, that will come out in a final report. Like I said, the local experts, um, this helps us in terms of identifying the assets. Um, we'll be at a number of events coming up. So we're going to give you a number of options of how you can provide us with information. Um, we also will be doing some presentations as this moves along in terms of gaining additional feedback on what we're finding. Um, and these, these bits of information that the public is giving to us provide the input for the ultimately for the draft resiliency plan um, that we will be using to make our recommendations. So like I said, the uh, the technical the consultant team is Colliers and Anchor QEA. Um, the process that we're looking at is uh, we're interdisciplinary firms, meaning that we're firms that have engineers, planners, architects, um, we have environmentalists that are all part of our firms, and they will be playing into the information that ultimately leads to strategies that we propose. There's an entire component that addresses the hydrodynamic modeling that's associated with the Long Island Sound and the waterways in the, uh, in the region. Um, this is what Anchor QEA will be doing. They'll be looking at different... Um, flood um, and um, and sea level rise um, levels. They'll be looking at flood years that are um, evaluated, whether it's a 100-year flood, a 500-year flood, um, storm surge in the model. Um, once they do the modeling and we have the assets that we're looking at, we'll look at Vulner, doing a vulnerability assessment where we layer this information and determine which areas are more vulnerable than others. And then we build out from there to the strategies to, to create a resiliency plan. So the scope of it, as I've discussed, we have identifying the community assets, which this is where the, the public is involved heavily in um, giving us information. Uh, we're doing the hydrodynamic modeling, which is this is the sea level rise scenarios. Then um, Colliers will be working on the risk assessment to identify vulnerable assets and systems. And then we'll be identifying the projects um, that 
projects uh, to increase the region's coastal resilience. So resources that sustain a community, when we're talking about what we're actually looking at, we're talking about um, doing this in the same fashion that FEMA recovery framework um, is set. And this looks at things like housing. It looks like your infrastructure. It looks at your infrastructure. It looks at health and social services. That could be your town halls. That could be hospitals. That could be um, things like your police, fire, EMS, all those facilities. Natural and cultural resources. This could be. Yeah, it could be marsh areas, it could be your historic buildings, it could be, like I said before, um, facilities that are related to the arts, um, those types of um, those types of aspects of a municipality. And then we look at the economic system, the uh, stores in your area, your service providers, um, to see how these um, disasters and disturbances impact them from a business perspective. So the second part of our study, as I said, was modeling for sea level rise. And this is kind of anticipating what, what the future would hold for the area. So we look at the models and develop sea level rise scenarios. And we're looking at this right now with the municipalities to determine what levels will be evaluated um, and this expertise is coming from, from folks that have done this in the Long Island Sound previously. So they've got a, a good base of information. Um, they look at parameters of the scenarios to be developed in coordination with the executive committee. Um, the modeling will be ground truth. So once they have this and they're talking about the areas that they feel um, would be impacted, we'll go back to the executive committee and uh, kind of ground truth this with them and say, does, is this reasonable? Does this seem like the areas that have been impacted in the near, you know, in the near past as we're looking to the future? Um, we lay the foundation for the vulnerability and the risk assessment through the sea level rise modeling. So then assessing the risk would be, you know, we're taking this, as I said before, and we're layering the community assets and the sea level rise scenarios to determine where the impact areas would be anticipated over time based on different levels of flooding. Um, the risk would be determined based on a value of the asset and the likelihood and severity of the flooding and will result in the identification of short and long-term projects uh, based on the risk. So the projects to increase resilience come in a number of different forms. Many of them we would think of as capital projects. That's like looking at, you know, does a roadway get raised or, you know, is there something physical like a living shoreline that gets installed? But there's other things like I mentioned where I said, you know, you look at your zoning. Um, is it where they should change the zoning maybe for a different building height to allow things to be raised um, that are there right now? Um, also, how does the first floor look in terms of, you know, breakout walls or venting and things like that? That would come under the regulations also, your land use regulations and your building codes. Um, in terms of planning, under the plan of conservation and development or your comprehensive plan for the municipalities, it could be something like areas where retreat may take place over time where if something actually gets knocked down more than, you know, the 50% uh, or so, maybe those areas don't get rebuilt. That's something that needs to be looked at, you know, in a long, long-term planning perspective. And then capacity building. Who are the people involved? Evacuation of areas. Um, who is in charge of, you know, directions for when an event takes place, all of that comes into play um, in terms of protecting people and protecting properties. So some examples, just a few things here. Um, you see one of the houses that's being raised, um, creation of living shorelines and, and breaks um, along the water that 
protect the water's edge more and the communities behind them. Um, some of this is retreating from an area and creating parkland that's very usable, but it also acts as storage, um, flood storage space. And so project prioritization, we'd be looking at an action plan for implementing projects and recommendations. We'll be identifying things like a lead entity when we um, list a project. Who are the key partners that should be involved? Can we develop a cost estimate for what we're proposing at this time, a possible time frame for implementing? And then immediate next steps and potential funding sources. These will be identified um, for each project that is prioritized um, as being, you know, one of the uh, concepts that gets moved forward for the municipalities. And what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at three to four projects per municipality and also two that are regional in nature. These numbers may, may change a little bit because if we find things that are more regional and we think that they are worth, you know, proposing for you, we'll do that. And then ultimately it um, culminates in development of the resiliency plan. So the draft plan we're uh, um, targeting for May of 2024 with a final plan by the end of June, 2024. Um, as you can see the project schedule, we started this past summer um, early on, we had a project kickoff. We've been holding a lot of community engagement um, on the technical side, we've been reviewing the data that has been available. And we're also um, looking at the asset mapping as we're meeting with the general public. The sea level rise scenarios are just going to be getting started probably within the next few weeks. Um, after that, the risk assessment would, would follow. Um, at the same time, we'll be looking, you know, once the risk assessment is taking place, we'll be starting to identify projects and prioritizing the projects themselves and developing concepts for them as we move to the spring. And during this um, winter and spring time period, we'll be working on the plan. Community engagement goes throughout the entire project. Um, we'll be, you know, gathering information and then we'll be reporting out on the information and fact checking it as we're going along. The public engagement part of this, um, we've been developing a community based plan um, with a priority on the planning process itself. Public engagement is occurring throughout the entire process um, with things like our project website working with the executive committee, community workshops, which are uh, hands-on, in-person type workshops. Um, we are having meetings like this, which would be virtual meetings online to get information out. We're gonna be attending a number of pop-up events and we have so far, we'll be at uh, one of the fairs this coming weekend. Um, again, stakeholder meetings and then online mapping tools. Um, and, this is important in terms of how we're gathering the information. So for everyone online from the public, there is a website. Um, it's for sure um, Coastal Resiliency. And we'll be giving you the uh, link to that at the end. There are links to add information on an interactive map. There's also um, a page where it lets you um, get onto the information, you know, from the website. So you would subscribe to it and you'll get notices. Um, the website itself is at the top of this page. It's foreshoreresiliency.com. So several ways to access the information and provide input. You can read about the project right on the website. You'll be able to access resiliency resources, um, learn about, uh, upcoming events, um, submit comments to the project on your own time. So 24 seven, it's available online. When you have the time, you go in there and you add um, your comments. And if you see somebody has already commented on something that you want to say, say it again, because that adds to the impact that we're looking at. The more that we're hearing about certain things, um, the more that we know that it's a level of importance that we should be focusing on. 
as I said, subscribe to the project and add the assets, issues, and opportunities to this interactive map. So community workshops, we have a number of different things coming up. I'm going to give you some dates as we're moving along. They address all ages. So there may be when we're at the fair, we'll even be trying to interact with children to see what they have to say. Um, it, it's open to everyone. And this is the type of way that we get feedback to understand more and more what is impacting people at all different levels, all different age groups, all different abilities. Um, so the intro to the resiliency plan and the community asset mapping, that's what we're doing now. In the winter, we'll be moving on to some of the community workshops that deal with the assessments and how we're prioritizing things. And as I said, uh, the spring would be where we roll out the plan. So a couple of upcoming events that I want to mention. Um, first off, this Saturday, we're going to be in Old Saybrook at the Arts and Crafts Fair. Um, we'll have a booth there probably a little before noon. 11 o'clock or so we'll be starting till about four o'clock. Um, so come and visit us there if you like to actually in person be giving us some of the information that you like. There'll be a hybrid workshop um, that uh, will be in Westbrook on October 2nd. Um, and then uh, that that is with a number of the um, the, the Beach Association in that area. And then we have an in-person workshop on October 10th at the old Saybrook uh, Middle School Auditorium. So we welcome your presence at that one. Um, also, uh, we'd like to see people coming out, giving us the information and interacting with some of the doc documents that we have to uh, provide your input. Um, we have been at a pop-up at the beach uh just a few weeks ago and there'll be more of these as we're going through the process like i said there's one on saturday again throughout the process um this is the one we're going to be in front of the katherine hepburn um theater um the kate so that's where you'll find us on saturday um in terms of the stakeholder meetings these are going to take place throughout the project um, we will be doing some one-on-one -on -one phone calls, some focus groups with specific groups, and um, we're getting these names through the executive committee. And then what we've learned so far, um, the pop-up event uh, where we received information in Westbrook, we had a pop-up event in Clinton at the Summerfest. Uh, we did a driving tour with the executive committee um, we've had comments submitted through the website and on the interactive map so far. Um, assets that are being identified have been historic districts and homes, um, the public docks and marinas, the beaches. Um, a lot of this deals with, you know, protection of boats and other assets. Um, emergency services have been identified, schools, recreational facilities, the beach communities, um, and urban forest. Uh, marine habitats and the salt marshes, wetlands and rivers um, and some critical areas uh, and vegetation in those locations. Some of the issues that we're seeing, um, hearing about are damaged seawalls and other structures like that. That's an important aspect, beach erosion. Um, this will help us identify better areas where shoreline protection is needed, um, roadways that are prone to flooding um, we've been told about some of the railroad underpasses that flood out heavily and some of the coastal roads, um, critical facilities um, at flood risk, um, like fire departments, um, the high tide flooding, uh, as well as storm surge and stormwater runoff um, and septic system failures and impacts to water quality, public health and ecological um, health. Uh, some of the locations that have been identified to us are Lobster Landing, Shore Road and Grove Way, Clinton Town Beach, Old Mail Trail, Pilots Point Neighborhood, um, a number of different streets, 
Chalker Beach, Cold Spring Marsh, um, stormwater runoff from US-1, um, and again, another, another street that's been identified here. This is what we need to hear about. These are the locations that we go back out to and do a greater investigation on. So it's important that um, we're gaining this information as we're going through the process. So the plan itself with the asset inventory development, these, these are our next steps. Um, setting the parameters for the hydrodynamic modeling that's being worked on this week and next week. And then the stakeholder meetings and the continued outreach I mentioned these dates to you already. Um, and again, this is the website. So please visit the project website, add your information, add your insight. Um, we welcome this information. And I wanna thank you at this time. And I'm going to see if there are any um, comments that have been added in the chat. Um, Bridget or Chris. So unfortunately, the chat is not available. That did not get set up. So I did see a hand raised. OK, is there a hand raised, um, Robin? I think, Chris, can you bring Robin in? We'll ask her. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I thank you for all that. That was excellent. Um, I just wanted to add that people can sign up on your website for email updates. So I just wanted to mention that in case. I Absolutely. Need and that's what I was talking about with subscribing. I believe that oh. that's the way that it is on there. So please do go in and subscribe because that's the way that we're adding you to a, an email list that we were putting blast emails out. Thank you again for mentioning that, Robin. Tony, did you have a comment? No, but I was just saying, I you said you couldn't see hands raised. Now, if I raise my hand, do you see uh -huh. it? Yes, I do. Okay. I don't know if that's only me who can do that. I don't know. If no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, well, again, we welcome your, you for joining us tonight. Um, I welcome you to go to the website in particular, if you want to go, you know, when you get off the call, just to, even to subscribe, that's a great thing to do at this point. And you have plenty of time to add your information. Um, the sooner that you add it, the better for us, because we'll want to look at this probably over the next month. We keep a running log of everything that's being added. Um, so that's important. Robin, do you have another um, um another I just have one. Yeah, I just have one more comment. I just want to stress to everybody on this call how important it is for us all to get the word out and and talk to our neighbors about it um, and encourage them to go onto the map and to subscribe and to come to the, the um, community outreach events. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah, and the community outreach where you can go and put your stuff, if you're not, into doing it on the computer, please come to one of the events. We'll have these maps there. You can add it in person. We are, again, like I say, taking all the comments and, and logging them. So this is a very important part of the process. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Okay, good night, everyone. Thanks, Debbie.